Anyway, good morning. Uh, it's good to be back in the Netherlands. Uh, I actually used to live here. I was in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, but it's many years ago. Uh, I'm based in the corporate finance organization at Statoil. I'll come back to the company in a minute. When I joined Statoil back in 1983, it was a smaller company than what it is today. And most small companies, they want to grow. They want to become bigger. Fair enough, and many succeed. But many also discover that we have not only become big, we have also become slow, bureaucratic, rigid. We have lost a lot of that agility, flexibility that we had as a smaller organization. This is just like the aging process of man. As we grow older, we do lose a bit of that flexibility we had as uh, teenagers. teenagers. Uh, and I have some practical experience here. Um, so. Uh, I think the big question for any big organization should be how can we find our way back to that agility we had as a small organization without losing the benefits of being big? So how can we be small and big at the same time? The big question for small organization should be how can we grow without ending up in the same place? Now, um, what I would like to share with you is um, first the case for change. Um, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on that with you guys. When I talk to finance people, I need to spend a lot of time helping them to understand that there is a serious problem with traditional management. Then we shall talk. I got a few general slides about this thing called Beyond Budgeting. It's actually a somewhat misleading name because the purpose of Beyond Budgeting is not necessarily to get rid of budgets. The purpose is to create organizations which are more agile and more human. And in order to do that, we need to change traditional management. And what do we find at the core of traditional management? We find the budgeting process and the budgeting mindset. So that's where the name is coming from. But as you will learn today, this is much, much uh, bigger. Then we shall spend, um, I shall finish off with uh, sharing with you how we are trying to do this at Statoil. Um, we started out 10 years ago, um, and uh, I'm saying trying because everything I will talk about is decided. It's written into what we call the Statoil book, which you can find at statoil.com, by the way. But that doesn't mean that all of this has reached every head and every corner of the organization. This is actually quite difficult for a lot of leaders because this is different. So I'm not going to share with you some kind of sanitized story about how fantastic we are, because change is hard. We've made mistakes, we've stumbled, we've had detours, but that's what real change is about. Real change is actually a bit messy. Now, uh, one way to position beyond budgeting is to call it management innovation. It's about exploring new ways of leading uh, and managing in knowledge organizations, operating in dynamic and competitive business environments which actually goes for most organizations these days. Uh, management innovation is not management of innovation. That's actually one of the problems. It's a great way to kill innovation, try to manage it. There is an interesting paradox when it comes to innovation, because we all love innovation, right? We want to be unique in the forefront, uh, leading edge, when it comes to technology and products. When it comes to management innovation, it's different. It's different. That's scary, right? And then we ask for, we say we want best practice, what we really want is common practice, what is everybody else doing? And maybe we should call the consultants to make sure that we are not doing anything stupid here. The consequence of this is that the left-hand side here is a very crowded place because everybody is doing it. Management innovation is not yet a crowded place because it is scary. And that is great news for brave companies who dare to embark on this journey because you get competitive advantage out of also exploring management innovation. So it's all about better performance. And I would like to reflect on this important word performance now for a few minutes in a different setting than organizations. I would like us to move into traffic. Because in traffic, we would also like to experience good performance when we are driving to work in the morning or back home or whatever. And my definition of good performance in traffic would be a safe and good flow of traffic. Right? Traffic authorities actually want the same, even if I've had my doubts from time to time, and they have different ways of achieving that, especially when there's crossing traffic. 
This is something we often meet, the traffic light. Two questions around the traffic light. Who is in control here and based on which information? And of course, the one who is in control here is the guy who programmed this light, right? And the information this programming would be based on would not be entirely fresh information as you're standing there waiting for that or sitting waiting for that green light. And the guy who made decisions here would not be in the situation together with you. But again, the best of intentions to create a safe and good flow. Then we have an alternative, the roundabout. Same questions, very different answers. Who is managing in the roundabout? Well, it's actually we as drivers. And the information we based our management and decisions on is real-time, fresh, here and now information. So very different answers. Could be interesting to compare a bit more these two ways of managing traffic. Uh, which is most efficient? And effective, by the way. Well, it's actually been proven that the roundabout is, is more, more uh, efficient. And maybe it has to do something with what you just talked about, uh, the access to fresh information. Of course you have access to fresh information in front of that light as well. But what you don't have is the authority to act on that information, because that authority rests with someone else. Which is most difficult to drive in? What is the roundabout? And again, back to organizations for a minute. Everything we are trying to leave behind as that of, of traditional management uh, is, in a way, much easier from a leadership point of view than what we know are trying to do instead. But we can't go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for the stuff that's good for performance. Um, and leadership is actually not meant to be easy. Last question before we leave traffic. Is it relevant to talk about values in this setting of traffic? And it's one of my many leading questions today, and the answer is yes. Uh, we sometimes talk about values-based management, and the opposite of values-based management, you could call rules-based management. Traffic light is a good example of rules-based management. Red is stop and green is drive. We can always discuss yellow, but <laughs> it is a very simple rules-based system. And if there is a value set, a mindset among drivers waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest, that is normally not a big problem in front of that light. But in the roundabout, me first, I don't care about the rest, is actually a big problem. Because in the roundabout, we have to interact with people in a very different way. We have to be more... Um, uh, we, have, we need a a positive common purpose of wanting this to flow well. We have to be more considerate. We have to interpret intentions of others. Um, so actually, me first, don't care about the rest, would be a big problem. Uh, trust and transparency is also important words here. Uh, in, the, in front of that traffic light, uh, the authorities are not really trusting us, right? We have to be managed uh, in the roundabout. They trust us to kind of manage ourselves. Transparency is important in front of that light. In theory, the only thing you need to see is the color of the light. You don't need to see the rest of the traffic. I never take that chance, but in, in, in theory. In the roundabout, it's very important that there is transparency, that you can see what's going on around you uh, to make decisions. Now, the roundabout is a more uh, self-regulating way of managing. Um, and it is also a setting where the label performance management is not very relevant. It's actually a phrase I don't like very much, even if I have it in my title for different reasons. Um, here, performance management is definitely a relevant label. That's exactly what authorities are doing. But in the roundabout, it is much less about managing performance. It's much more about creating conditions for great performance to take place. And I think as, uh, uh, as finance people, as HR people, uh, and actually I work both places, that is something we need to reflect on in how we do our job. Because I think, our, I think there's a lot of illusions of control here. Um, when finance people, HR people say that if we don't manage performance, there will be no performance. When they say that if we don't develop people, there will be no development. I mean, that is... Bullshit, excuse me. It is not true. It is much more illusions of control, but it's not bad news because there's a lot of stuff we can do to create conditions for performance to take place and for people to develop themselves. Again, back to self-regulation. I would argue that in today's realities, organizations need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. The first reason has to do with our business environment, which has a lot more out there of what they call 
VUCA. You've probably heard that expression, V-U-C-A, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And if we take that VUCA seriously, it should have significant implications for how we design our management models compared to if there is no VUCA out there, right? The other reality we need to reflect on and take the consequences of is not external, it's internal, it has to do with people. It has to do with asking ourselves, what kind of people do we generally think we have in our organizations? And one language for that discussion was invented by Douglas McGregor, 1960. He wrote a great book called The Human Side of Enterprise. And he introduced what he called Theory X and Theory Y. It's got nothing to do with Generation X and Y, that came much la la later. It's basically two opposing views on people and what motivates people. Theory X is very much the negative view. It's the view that most people in an organization is a bunch of potential thieves and crooks, which all must be managed tightly and kept on short leeches, because if not, we know what will happen. They will all run away, do a lot of stupid things, and spend money like drunken sailors. Well, that was the popular version. Gregor, he was a bit more polite and academic in his book, but I think that's what he meant. Then you have theory Y, very much the opposite view, a view that most people, beyond being many are well-educated, uh, that there's a lot of competence and that most people want to do a good job. They want to perform, they want to be involved, they want to be listened to, they want to be treated as adults. And again, we don't need to, so far to agree on what we mainly believe in, although I hope we mainly believe in Y, but it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in Y, it has very different consequences for our management model compared to if we mainly believe in X. Now, if we combine these two realities we need to reflect on, the world out there, people in the organization, it could look like this. You recognize the two dimensions, and I would argue that traditional management lies in this lower left-hand corner. One more reflection on X and Y before I move on here. Um, you know, I hope you've understood that at Statoil, our sympathy is on this side, but we are not naive. And every time I talk about X and Y, there are some faces popping up in my head. And I can see those guys right now. Those faces belong to people at Statoil that I think I would put here. Right? I think you need to keep a close eye on those guys. They are not many, but they exist. And there might be some faces popping up in your heads as well, because those people, I mean, they can exist in any organization. That is not the issue. The issue is, do they represent a minority or a majority? Because if they exist but represent a minority, we cannot base the design of our management models on minorities. Right? We need to base that design on our majority view, and if that is why, that needs to drive the design. Now, in order to get out of traditional management, we need to address both dimensions, both leadership horizontally, management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of is something that's very rigid, it's very detailed, it's very annual, it's very rules-based, a lot of micromanagement, centralized command and control, a lot of secrecy, and a strong belief in sticks and carrots, like, for instance, individual bonuses. Now, there might have been a time when this was the right place to be the right thing to do. I'm not arguing that there might still be places around where this is the right thing to do. might be. But for us in Stato, that discussion is completely uninteresting. And by the way, I'll come back to the company a bit later. Um, because we know that our business environment is up here. That's a fact. And we believe that the majority of people at Stato is on this side. So we need to move up in that upper right-hand corner. And the route is, again, by addressing both dimensions. On the leadership side, we need to be more values-based than rules-based. That does not mean no rules. It simply means that the stronger you are on the value side, the less rules you typically need. We need more autonomy. In this VUCA world, there isn't always time, or very seldom time, to run nine floors up to get that decision, because then it can be too late. And by the way, decisions aren't always improved because they are lifted upstairs. Very, very often it's the other way around. We need more transparency. And this is good news for all the scared managers I've met over the years, who are afraid of leaving this rather comfortable, safe corner because they are afraid of losing. What do you think they are afraid of losing? Control, right? And that fear is real because I can see it in the eyes. What they maybe don't understand is that a lot of those controls they are afraid of losing are nothing but illusions of control. But still, the fear is real. So here are some good news for scared managers. Transparency can be a great control mechanism. It's a social control mechanism. And there is a reason why most thieves and crooks operate at night, right? Because then it's dark. There's no transparency. And you might have heard this wonderful story from Roche, the uh, giant pharmaceutical company, uh, quite traditionally managed, but they did a very interesting experiment around travel cost. 
in a pilot. They kicked out the travel budget. They kicked out most travel rules and regulations. What they introduced instead was full transparency on travel cost. So everybody could see if you traveled to where, did you fly, eat, and sleep, cheap or expensive. Open for your colleagues to see and vice versa. What do you think happened with travel cost in the pilot? Came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism. I'll give you another example in a, in a minute. Last but not least, we need to get hold of that internal, the intrinsic motivation in people that can move mountains if you really can mobilize it. And my experience is that most managers, they accept that there is something called intrinsic internal motivation. But here is where it goes wrong, because they think that, well, if we, on top of that internal motivation, add a bit of external motivation, extrinsic motivation, then you get more motivation. That sounds quite logical, doesn't it? Well, let's, let's take a look at what research is saying here. Initially, research, research says, yes, you do get more motivation if three conditions are present. If there's little motivation in the job itself, if it's easy to count, and if quantity is more important than quality. So for chasing rats, picking fruits, whatever, individual bonus is a great motivation mechanism. But then research goes on, and telling us that when work is more complex, when more cognitive skills are needed, when more teamwork is needed, then you lose that effect. You not only lose it, but very often it has a negative effect. It's called the crowding out effect. The, the external motivation eats from the internal motivation, and the total is actually less motivation. So I hope you understand that it's not only budgets I've lost my belief in. Uh, I am not a big fan at all of individual bonuses. And by the way, I never understood it. If individual bonus should be so great for motivation, how, find, how can we find the biggest doses at companies at the top? So is that where we find the most boring jobs in companies? The CEO, the CFO, and so on? They have the biggest bonuses? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Anyway, um, at Stator, we have always tried to be a people-oriented, values-based company. I'm not saying we're perfect, but it is important for us. This book says a lot about it. So our challenge was maybe more that we had management processes that had a different message, because it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership visions if you have theory X management processes. So our journey has very much been about trying to change our management processes to reflect what we say about people, and at the same time make these management processes more VUCA robust. Here's an example of thing, some things that you typically need to do. Typically, the detailed annual uh, traditional budget needs to go, because it represents so much of traditional management. More specifically, we need to think differently around how we think around targets and goals. To the extent we still have them, we need less of what I call 29.2 targets. Right? The target is 29.2, anything above is good, anything below is bad, end of story. That is a very narrow mechanical language for, and often a misleading language for describing performance. So we need, sometimes we need to think more in relative terms. Well, how are we doing versus others? It doesn't help that we hit 29.2 if the other ones are doing 30 or 35 and vice versa. We need to think about how we achieve these results. We need to think about values. Uh, we need to take into account when we shall evaluate performance, hindsight insights, all the things we know afterwards that we didn't know up front. We call this a holistic performance evaluation. I'll come back to that. And last but not least, we have to kind of break out of this prison called the calendar year. Why should everything we do circulate around a period which, is, which runs from January to December? It makes sense for accounting, it makes sense for tax, but that is not the stuff we are talking about here. So we need to organize our processes more event-driven, more business-driven, and less calendar-driven. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what Beyond Budgeting is about. Trying to move up in that upper right-hand corner by addressing both leadership and management processes in a consistent way to become more agile and more human. There's a number of companies on this journey in some form or shape. Here's an overview of some of them. And um, I could have spent the rest of the day talking about fantastic management innovation going on in these companies. We don't have the time, so I need to just to pick a few examples here. Let's start in the IT business. Miles is a Norwegian IT company. No budgets, no targets, no nothing. Well, they have a few simple forecasts, that's all. Their most important process is recruitment. They spend an enormous time getting the right people on board. They never take less than 10 references. And when management is interviewing, the interview is only about uh, 
beliefs, values, uh, behaviors, they don't talk IT at all. They leave that talk to skilled IT people already on board. And if the IT employee says no, then it is a no because they have a veto right. IT company, so your PC is important. Um, Miles employees can buy whatever PC they want uh, and change it as often as they want. Competence training is important. They can attend whatever training they want, as often as they want, wherever in the world. The only thing the company requires is that when they have bought that PC, when they have returned from that training, they have to post what they did and the cost of it on the internet. So, a social control mechanism. And they have just one small concern. It's not a big concern. One, just one small concern around this control mechanism. Could it be too effective? Right. Now, the veteran here is the company you see on top, Handelsbanken. It's a Swedish bank that today operates across Europe, has around 900 branches across Europe. It's the fastest growing bank in the UK. This bank completely abolished traditional budgeting already back in 1970. Not as a goal in itself, it's just one of many things they did to become more agile and more human. So no budgets, no targets, no forecast, no nothing. Just a lot of decentralization, a lot of autonomy, and a lot of transparency. And that's interesting, but that is not a goal in itself. The goal is good performance. Let's look at how this company has performed over the last 40 years. This company has been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. This bank is among the most cost-effective universal banks in Europe. This bank has never needed a bailout from the authorities because they messed it up. I can think of a number of other prestigious banks who at some point in time needed help because they messed it up. This bank, never. Bloomberg has rated Handelsbanken as the most solid bank in Europe. It can't be a coincidence. A radically different management model, fantastic performance. Handelsbanken and some other companies, they inspired what in the late 90s became known as beyond budgeting. So actually beyond budgeting as a, as a kind of a, a philosophy came about roughly at the same time as agile. Um, and these are the beyond budgeting principles. I will not go through this in details. I have talked a little bit about stuff here already on the leadership side. I will talk a little bit more about this when we come to Statoil in a minute. Um, but a few reflections on these principles. First of all, these principles do not represent a management recipe. Right? These are principles. They provide guiding, inspiration. But what this should mean in your organization, that depends on your history, your culture, your business. So it's not identical what has happened in these organizations on the previous slide. And that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes, because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. Right? Your only job is to read all the books, hire the consultants and tick the boxes. I find that quite boring, but also quite dangerous. So if you like to think for yourself, there's a lot of great news in Beyond Budgeting. Another important message. This is an attempt to create a consistency between we, what we say about people in leadership on the left-hand side and what we do in our management processes on the right-hand side. Let me give you a few examples of the opposite, of lack of consistency that you so often find in organizations. It doesn't help that we here on this side talk loud and warm about we and us and together and team and everybody in the same boat. But everything we do on incentives is about individual bonus. Right, right or wrong, there is a gap between what we say and what we do. It's poison. Another example, it doesn't help that we talk equally loud and warm here about how fantastic people we have on board. And we would be nothing without you, and we trust you so much. But not that much. Of course, we need detailed travel budgets, right? Guess what would happen if we skip those? Poison. Uh, and I hope you also see that beyond budgeting is about so much more than another way of managing cost. Yes, we need different ways of managing cost compared to the traditional budget, but that's just one of 12 principles. Now, when we started out in Statoil 10 years ago, um, we were a bit careful uh, showing these principles too widely. Today, that would, wouldn't be an issue. Um, but let me share with you the Statoil model. And this is us in a nutshell, uh, Scandinavia's largest company. And here's some data on the company. Um, yeah, so basically, that's us. Um, and our journey started in uh, 2005. And our process, we call, we call it ambition to action. Three purposes, 
translate strategies, securing this flexibility, agility I talked about, and last but not least, activate, activating what we say in this book about people and values and leadership. Now, there are some steps in this process which might be familiar. Um, you might have something similar in your organization, but I think the way we do this is probably somewhat different. It starts with strategy over here, which we try to make a bit more concrete by making what we call strategic objectives, which is what does success look like on a medium-term time horizon? We are more on words than on numbers. Then we are trying to find KPIs that can measure that we are moving towards these uh, objectives. But the only problem with measurement is that measurement alone moves nothing. Nothing happens just because we measure. You don't lose weight simply by weighing yourself. I have tried. <laughs> no big success. And then my wife, she has a sharp tongue from time to time, and she told me a bit dryly that, Bjorte, maybe you didn't stand there long enough on that weight. Well, that would have been one kind of action, but the point is that nothing happens before we do something. So there's a big emphasis on actions. And last but not least, what does this mean for you and me and the teams that we are in? And here is an example of translating words in the book. Because the very first words in the Statoil book says, at Statoil, the way we deliver is as important as what we deliver. And with the way we deliver, we talk about behaviors and the values in this book. And that decision came from our CEO to make sure that everybody understood that he was serious about this. He put the weighting between the what and the how in all consequences for your career, for your uh, base pay, individual bonus, if you, if you, if you have that. Uh, he put that weighting to 50-50. And you might say that that was a brave decision. But on the other hand, it was an obvious decision because how can we say in this book that we are trying to be a values-based company. Everything around values is completely absent from our performance process. Uh, let me share with you some areas here where we try to be distinctly different from others. Uh, let me start with KPIs, um, which are kind of coming from the balanced scorecard thinking. And um, I have a very ambivalent view on, on KPIs. We need to remember that the I in KPI stands for indicators, right? They are indicators. They're trying to indicate that they're moving towards our objectives. But they are not necessarily telling the full truth. They are not called KPTs, key performance truth. They are called key performance indicators. I spent too many years of my life searching for those perfect KPIs. I've given up simply because they don't exist. Uh, Albert Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So measurement can be a good servant, but as a master alone, measurement can be a disaster. You can't run it only by the numbers. When we started out many, many years ago um, with KPIs, there was only KPIs. There was nothing here, nothing here. And again, then you get a very narrow mechanical performance language. You need something broader, and you also need this holistic performance evaluation, which I will come back to, where we take off our measurement glasses and look at what measurement didn't pick up before we make any kind of conclusions. Now, here is an example of an ambition to action. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but it's uh, inspired by the so-called balanced scorecard, uh, trying to identify all the drivers that, in the end, give you good financial uh, results. And by the way, the way we define financial results and performance is not any absolute numbers. It's all about league tables. We have defined a league table of 11 other oil and gas companies. And for all, it's all about how we are doing versus those companies. So we set the relative targets, uh, just like in football. Uh, but again, if you want good financial performance, you need to perform well towards customers and market. You will never do that unless you're good on internal operations. You will never be good on internal operations unless you're good on health, safety, and the environment, and people and organizations. So this is about winding back to the things that, in the end, give you good performance. You can't manage down here. If you want to manage or create conditions for great performance to take place, it has to happen in those other uh, dimensions. And the consequence can be good performance. Today, we have around 800 of these in the organization. It might sound like a big number, but nobody has a relationship to, to 800. You have a relationship to your own and those around you. And let me use this slide towards the end to illustrate two other areas where we try to be different. The first has to do with creating so-called alignment. 
you know, this red thread throughout, so that we are kind of walking reasonably in the, in the same direction. It can't be chaos, it can't be anarchy. There is a simple way of creating alignment that a lot of finance people love, but that's the wrong way. It's called cascading. It's called sitting, sitting at the top, corporate finance, and then cascading down. These are your strategic objectives, these are your KPIs, these are your KPI targets. And you know, finance people, when they, can, when they can add up all the local numbers here, and it matches the corporate number, then they think they can sleep well at night. We will deliver because all the numbers add, add up. They are so wrong. Because if that kind of cascading kills everything around involvement, commitment, motivation, it is worth nothing. We still need alignment, but we also need commitment, involvement, uh, motivation. We achieve that balance through what we call translation instead of cascading. Translation is about any team here, when they shall make their own ambition to action, they would look around. They would look to the level, level above, uh, maybe all the way up to corporate, maybe a bit left and right if there are interfaces. And then this team shall have a deep and good discussion about how, what should our ambition look like in order to support the direction and ambition levels of other teams that we have a relationship to. And if such a translation should go wrong, which is almost, it's not the problem, but if it should go wrong, of course the, 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 the level above should intervene and do what they are paid for, but one reason why it's not a problem is again transparency. Because all of these ambition to actions are open for all employees. There is some share sensitive information we have to hide, but beyond that, everything is open. So there's no place to hide with a stupid ambition to action, with the wrong direction or, or too low ambition levels. Uh, this doesn't mean that we never cascade. There are situations, there can be critical situations where a little doses of that can be needed, but it should be much more the exception than the rule, then it's also more accepted when it, when it happens. The other area we try, and by the way, it's not mandatory to have an ambition to action. Teams decide for themselves. And many teams, they ask us, I mean, should we have an ambition to action in, in, in our team? And our answer would be that, well, we would definitely recommend this. But your decision should be driven by whether you and your team perceive this as a good way of managing yourself. Right? That should be your motivation. So, but even if it's not mandatory, the, the number has kind of steadily been, been, uh, been increasing. Now, another issue has to do with time. We used to have annual versions of ambition to action. Right? So every autumn, we made a new one for next. All these teams made a new one for next year. It wasn't a budget process, but it was still an annual process. We don't do that anymore. Um, in 2010, we decided to skip annual versions. So now these teams, all these teams can update whatever they want on their own ambition to action when there is a need for it. Right? They can update objectives when strategy change. They can update... KPIs, if these objectives change, or if they simply find a better KPI, they can even change their KPI targets if these targets have lost their meaning. Um, and lost their meaning could mean this target is impossible to achieve, or it's a piece of cake. Um, the only control mechanism we put around this is that if you want to change something that's big, you can do that at any time, but if it's big, you still need to get a yes from above. Uh, one level up. Uh, if it's small, you simply inform to the same level. Big or small, always make sure that you inform those affected by your changes. So this is the coordination of it. Um, and we have left it to the organization itself to define what is big and what is small. It's not something we can define at corporate level, which means that there might be someone over here that have a different definition of big and small than someone over here. But that's okay as long as it works both places. Targets. Um, first of all, we are saying that you don't always need to set targets, right? And generally, I think we set too many targets. Uh, some people say that you, if, well, if there is no target, then you can't evaluate performance. Well, that's bullshit. Um, uh, and so, I hope that the next step on our journey here will be that we set much less targets than what we do today. But the important thing is actually who sets those targets. I'm much more relaxed about targets that teams set for themselves compared to targets coming from above. And again, the kind of targets you set is also important, right? I'm more in favor of relative targets than absolute targets. But targets should have natural time horizons. Why should all targets have a deadline end of December? It doesn't make sense, 
right? So to the extent there are targets, have natural time horizons. Some short if there's urgency, some longer if, if it's more complex. Um, you can still, if you want, have an annual performance evaluation where you look at performance once a year. And some targets would be completed three months ago. Some is still work in progress, so, so that's not a problem. Um, let me then move to the holistic performance evaluation, which I've touched upon a few times. And holistic means two things here. First of all, it's the 50-50 between the what and the how. Second, it is about when we shall assess especially the what side, the delivery side, it is about pressure testing measurement before we conclude. Because if perform evaluation is reduced or dumped down to only counting the number of red and green KPIs, uh, the only qualification you need as a leader is actually two things. Well, first of all, you must be able to count. And second, you can't be colorblind. And I wouldn't pass because I can count, but I'm colorblind. But anyway, I mean, we, <laughs> we, we, we can't reduce that important job to something uh, that dumb. So, Yes, we do count, but that's just the starting point. Then we take off the measurement glasses and look at what measurement didn't pick up. Yes, I see that that KPI is green, but have we really moved towards those strategic objectives if we look at what measurement didn't pick up? How ambitious were those targets? If you have one team that set themselves an ambitious target, really stretched and is inspired by somebody else, target up here, didn't completely make it. KPI, yellow, green. Then you have another team over here, the leader is a kind of a good negotiator, good at gaming, low balling. Oh, it's so difficult. We're able to get the target down here, performance here. Wow, green KPI. Take away those targets. Which team performed best? Should we punish the team that stretched and didn't completely make it compared to the team that kind of low balled and, and, and made it? We, has there been significant changes in assumptions, significant headwind, tailwind that we should take into account? Right? And a few other questions which we need to ask before we can conclude what kind of performance are we looking at. And today we do have a, a rating scale in both dimensions, one to five. Um, I'm not a big fan of rating scales, and we have that discussion as many others. Shall we simply skip that rating, um, which I hope we will do. But the important thing for me is that we have this holistic uh, uh, pressure testing. And the outcome of that, um, that, that score is the basis for development plans for all employees and for rewards, base pay adjustments, and individual bonus for those on individual bonus. So we do have individual bonuses, very modest compared to our competitors. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it, but again, the important thing is that we have this, this holistic uh, evaluation. So to conclude, um, going back to the traffic metaphor, what we are trying to do is to change our management model, the way we think about these important issues kind of leaving the traffic light performance management where you're thinking, and to transform this into something that has more to do with creating conditions for great performance to take place. When it comes to how we manage cost, I didn't have time to talk about that, but we don't have traditional cost budgets. Um, more event-driven, more translation, more relative KPIs, and more transparency and less secrecy. This is an attempt to simplify, but simple is, first of all, simple is not the same as easy. And also, yes, our management processes are simpler, but from a leadership point of view, this is not simpler. And it shouldn't be, because leadership is not meant to be, uh, is not meant to be simple. Um, so I hope there is time for some uh, questions afterwards. I think we've got uh, time for that. But if anybody wants to contact me later on, these are my coordinates. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I only tweet about this stuff. There's no cats and dogs and family, only beyond budgeting. Uh, and if you're even more interested, there's something called the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, which is a global network of organizations interested in this. I'm the chairman of the European one. If you want to come along at one of our European meetings, you're more than welcome. The next one is in, Lo in London, uh, mid of October. And if you're even more interested, um, this is the commercial of the day. Um, Seven, eight years ago, I wrote a book about Beyond Budgeting. Uh, so much has happened afterwards that I've just uh, completed a significantly revised second edition, um, which is out now in, uh, next month in the US and a bit later in, in Europe. All right, I was asked to put on this slide towards the end. So if you like the session, please rate it. If you didn't, don't bother. <laughs> All right, any questions?
or comments, reflections? And I assume you're thinking about the climate, uh, climate issue here. Uh, let me first say that um, we, we do not, definitely do not deny climate change. It's real, and we are part of the problem. We believe that we can also be part of the, the uh, solution here. Uh, if Europe is consuming more gas than coal, uh, uh, then that would definitely help. But uh, we, we uh, definitely are part of the, uh, the problem. So you ask, I mean, how are we able to, re to attract young people? Uh, we have long been the most popular employer at Statoil, uh, and we still are. Uh, and I think it has something to do with the fact that we are trying to be different. Uh, we hit the ground running in 1972. We had to catch up in a very short time uh, with the other oil companies that have been doing this for 100 years. So autonomy, decentralization, and so on, there was no choice. I mean, people were given big jobs at young age. I joined Statoil in 1983. 1984, I was the head of the corporate budget department. Yeah. So uh, the answer is that, uh, from a recruitment point of view, this, is, um, this uh, at least so far, is not an issue. Uh, and um, it's the same in the US, where we typically recruit from other our competitors, other oil and gas companies, and people come to us that they want to work for us because we operate in a different way. Um. There are possibilities to have uh, recorded uh, uh, yeah, a record of your thoughts and your thinking. I want to show it to others. So if you can share a recording of my talk, well, I, I, they are videoing it, and I assume that my voice is going on to that as well, so um, yeah. Just ask these guys, I have no problem. So, absolutely. I appreciate that. So, moving out of traditional uh, management uh, process, you said one of the things uh, holding back traditional management is the fear of losing control. Mm. But don't you think it's uh, more on uh, the fear of not having uh, tools or levers to enforce control once you move to a more dynamic management process? So, the question is about. Um, the fear of losing control being uh, also about the fear of not having those tools available. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's part of the losing control thing. Uh, it's the kind of the, it's the mental fear and it is the kind of the tools uh, thing. But, but again, I mean, this is about leadership. And uh, uh, also, this is not about abandoning control. It's about getting rid of what we should call bad control but it's about reinforcing what we should call good control. Transparency is an example of, of a good control mechanism. So we are telling these scared managers that you might actually get more control by doing this, by leaving behind all those illusions of control, the bad controls. Uh, so the question is about the uh, transparency mechanism uh, at miles around, around uh, uh, that everything is open, available, uh, and, and what Roche did. Um, first, first of all, at Statoil, we do not, on transparency, we do not go down on individuals. We stop at teams. So yes, travel cost, we show, I mean, travel patterns among teams and show trends and so on, but we don't go on individual level. And I think that transparency is, um, is a very delicate control mechanism. You have to use it with caution and with wisdom, uh, because you can really fail, if you, because it's not about naming and, and, and shaming and blaming. It's about creating a... It, it should mainly actually be about learning. What can we learn from others? And then you get this gentle performance pressure as a nice side effect. But try to position it more as learning. How can we learn from others if everything is secret? Right? Mm -hmm. 
I think the, uh, um, the biggest learning over this journey, which actually started 20 years ago, uh, in 1995, I was uh, heading up finance in a company called Borealis, uh, which, uh, where we kicked out the budget then back in 1995. At that point in time, that was before I had had my HR career, at that point in time, my problem definition was much more narrow. It was about kind of the resource waste of budgeting and, and uh, the, uh, the time we spent and so on. And I didn't see as clearly as today all the people and leadership aspects of this. I didn't see how it kind of all has to connect. I think that's been my biggest learning. And uh, uh, again, that is why I love these beyond budgeting principles, because they are trying to address the totality of these important issues. Right? And it has to hang together. And there's a lot of great stuff out there on... Um, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. Some people ask, how come Beyond Budgeting is taking so much longer than, for instance, uh, uh, Agile, Lean, some Balanced Scorecard, some other popular concepts, which are... Uh, and there's a simple reason for it. You can't compare this, this stuff. Uh, for two reasons, Beyond Budgeting is different on granularity and on scope. Beyond Budgeting is low on granularity. It's not very specific. And, but it's very high on scope. It tries to address everything under the leadership and management agenda. Uh, no criticism towards Agile, uh, Lean, or whatever, but those concepts do not necessarily have clear views on uh, resource allocation, on incentives, on you know, a lot of stuff we are trying to address all of it. So the totality is my biggest learning. Mm. Mm. How does that work? Yeah. So the question is, how does this uh, comparison through relative KPIs work? And first of all, most of our relative KPIs are internal. They are not external. I shared an example of some external Statoil's financial performance compared to 11 other oil and gas companies, but that's the, more the exception. 98% of our relative KPIs are internal, comparing, for instance, platforms in the North Sea on regularity, safety, uh, uh, production unit cost and so on, um, and again, with the main purpose of learning, but you get this gentle performance push. This is what Handelsbanken is doing. They compare branches on three simple KPIs, customer satisfaction, return on equity, cost income ratio. But there are no targets. What they say, we don't need to set targets because nobody likes to be laggards. It's a very simple self-regulating uh, way of driving performance. But learning should be the main purpose. And internally, we have this data. We have a common database with all this, uh, the actual performance of everybody. So it, it's not a problem. It's, it can be a bit more difficult externally. You mentioned that you still have individual bonuses mm. in your system. Uh, or at the company, but you also mentioned that you are a dentist. Mm. Could you elaborate a bit on what you do as a dentist? So the question is, uh, what are the alternatives to individual bonus? I think there's a lot of alternatives. First of all, I, you know, I, I challenge the notion of individual performance as a starting point. How individual is really performance today? I mean, this notion of the lone ranger riding out at sunset and kind of blowing the smoke off his Smith & Wesson after having kicked some ass and sorted out today's trouble. That is something of the past. I mean, even if in what we herald as individual performance, take sales. Well, maybe that sale today was the result of great back office performance on the previous sale. Right? So I, kind of, I think the problem already starts with defining performance at an individual level. But second, organizations have bonus for two different reasons. There is a market reason. We have to be competitive. I can buy into that, but there are many ways of being competitive. The second is it's good for motivation. And that is where I'm challenging this stuff, because theory, uh, research is saying the very opposite. Alternatives, uh, common bonus schemes. Uh, you might have heard about the, uh, uh, the peer bonus schemes that uh, Jürgen Appello, for instance, talks about, uh, where, uh, I mean, everybody gets a, a bonus, but you are not allowed to keep it. You have to pass it on to colleagues that you think deserve it. And it's based on the notion that colleagues know better about who performs than, 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 uh, than, than the boss. You could argue it's, it's some kind of individual bonus still, but it's, it's st still a better solution. But again, you should read a great book, um, Alfie Kuhn, 
punished by rewards. It's a wonderful book that kind of really, yeah. All right, uh, one more quick question, then I think we need to, to, to close. So the question is, if, if you can have transparency on, on salaries. Well, actually, in Norway, the authorities are doing that job for us, because all the kind of uh, the tax, uh, all kind of tax information is uh, is posted, uh, is public. Um, but again, I mean, transparency is not a goal in itself, right? Uh, the main purpose is learning, and I'm not sure if I see the learning purpose of of kind of knowing, knowing other people's salary. But, yeah. Again, there's no right or wrong here. In some companies it might work, other companies it, it, it wouldn't. But generally, it's a very effective self-regulating control mechanism. All right, it's 10 past. Uh, you've got more stuff to do, so thank you very much.